the presence of God is so strong. Can anybody feel it? <laughs> Amen. Uh, for those that are new, we're continuing on with our series, uh, Disarmed, and we didn't even know it. First Samuel chapter 13. Don't open there. We're not going there today yet or today. Uh, First Samuel 13, 19 to 22. It speaks on how the Philistines oppressed the Israelites. And they basically did it in such a clever way that the blacksmiths that make the weapons and that make the farming tools for productivity, they took them out. They ensured that there were no more blacksmiths in the land. And they did it in such a clever way that the blacksmiths that existed were only the Philistine blacksmiths. And I shared with you that one of the things I believe the Lord wanted us to really open our eyes to see in this moment is that God is trying to restore those he has called in the fivefold offices. That not only do we accept the teacher, the evangelist, the pastor, but in this season, there's an emphasis on the apostles and the prophets. That the devil very cleverly has taken away some blacksmiths and in fact, done it in such a way that false blacksmiths exist. So the reverse has happened that we don't even want anything to do with anybody called an apostle or prophet. You know, so many stories are flying about. Some of us think for the sake of safety, I'm going to stay away from that angle. But it's actually a tactic of the enemy to try and disarm us in this season. Hence the title of the series, Disarmed, and we didn't even know it. And one of the things that we've said in this season is we will we'll take our time to explain and go through each point as is required and the sermon before last week uh, some key points to help us get back on track we spoke about the word apostolos which is where the uh, English word apostle comes from and you know we said that it's a Greek ideology I'll go to what it meant in a minute to remind you Greek ideology and one of the things that came to mind was how the timing of God is so key. The timing of God is so clever. One day I was sat down and I was thinking, this happens to me a lot with analogies. And I said to myself, if there was no car, there would be no drive-through. Have you, Has anybody thought like that before? Drive-throughs would not exist if cars did not exist. So it's funny that God waited until the, the language in the world had developed to such a point there was a language called the Greek language that can break down everything that we're going through, you know, and then suddenly a man called Paul appears on the scene. And if you read the Testament of Paul or the epistles, he even says some of the revelations of God, they've been kept until now to be revealed now. And sometimes this is a prophetic word to someone. It feels like, God, why are things not falling in place for me yet? There is something that needs to happen before the car can drive through. Or rather, the car needs to be built before the drive through is made. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? It's so key, the way God works. And I found that very interesting. Another thing that I found interesting was that the gospel hadn't come yet until Romans had established themselves. Does anybody know one of the, one of the great things that Romans did for us in the world? in their establishment when they came as an empire? Anybody shout? Yes, they built roads. So if God comes before the Romans build the roads and says, go ye into all the nations, how are you going to get there? <laughs> the roads became available. So it's easy for you to say, do you know what? I'm going to cross over. Think about the ships. Think about the ships that were made. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I saw a sign for animals, there's going to be a great plague. I don't know. I, I was trying to determine uh, so many animals are going to die. I don't know why that is a thing. But I speak against and put a line and an end to any challenge that's coming up with animals. And I, I pray that it doesn't contaminate and cross over to become a thing for humans as well. In the name of Jesus, I, it's, it's, it's going to be quite bad. We might see it soon. Uh, I saw many animals dying. Lord, we speak against that in the name of Jesus. Different kinds, whatever the spiritual implication of that is, we come against it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. God has a way of planning, setting things up so that what is needed doesn't come before the infrastructure that's required to hold it has been set up. It's very, very important. 
And one of the things that we've said in this season is one of the reasons why God wants to bring a spotlight back to the blacksmiths, the apostles and prophets, is that he's raising cutting-edge ministries that are going to expand the Great Commission like never before. Uh, you know, they're going to do it in partnership together with the fivefold offices, but God is raising. And if the church is not aware and in a place, especially our generation, where we understand the importance of all the fivefold offices, there are certain things that we are going to miss out on. Amen? We said the word apostolos, it means, it was a Greek word, it's not a Christian word first, it was a Greek word that is a combination of the authority, the mission, and the teachings of the place that you've been sent from. So when a, an, a, an empire defeats another empire, they send an apostle, apostolos, to that place. Another word that you can use to understand the word apostolos is passport. That's actually where passport was developed from. They are sent with documents to a place with the right authority, with a mission. There is always a specific mission for every apostolos. They would get to a place with a specific mission and the teachings of the place that they've come from to try and infiltrate and change the way that the people they've just defeated think. So when they conquer a land, if you don't teach the people your ways, they just continue and one day they can even rise up and come and attack again. So those apostolos or apostles, as we know them in English, they were either delegates, they were either ambassadors, or they were naval expedition leaders. They'd be sent to a region to go and take over the region that's been defeated with the right authority, with the right mission, and the right teachings. And as I said last week, uh, an area of focus for us with the time that we have is helping us to understand that God always does these things through people. And right now I want us to open scripture to Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8. We started this last week and we will continue. NKJV version, please. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8. It says, also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? The voice of the Lord was saying, who shall I send? Usually, the answer to solutions is a person or people. Turn to someone next to you say, the answer to solutions. Does that make sense? The answer to problems. You weren't listening. Turn to someone else that's awake in this. I say, the answer to problems is people. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then Isaiah responds, Here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. Again, from last week, Genesis chapter 45, verse 1 to 8, NLT version. You can read this in your own time for uh, reference. But we looked at verse 5 specifically, and we said, Don't be upset. This was Joseph speaking to his brothers. Verse 5, Genesis 45, verse 5. NLT, don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. Guess what? It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. God saw ahead. In fact, in the book of Genesis, God prophesied to Abraham, your people will be stuck in a land, the land of Egypt, for 400 years. They did a bit more than that, but it was supposed to be 400 years. And after 400 years, they will go to the promised land. God sends a person as the solution. I'm trying to help us understand. Joseph has an understanding of this. He sends a person. Verse 5. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. If you keep reading, verse 6. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. Verse 8. So it was God who sent me here, not you. He is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all of Egypt. I also showed you last week Psalm 85, 81 verse 5, the first part of it, NKJV. It says, this, he, speaking of God, established in Joseph, if you read the verses before, it speaks of the promises of God for the children of Israel. He established it 
in someone, inside someone. Turn to someone next to you and say, it is possible <laughs> for God to establish a solution inside someone. Inside someone. Inside someone. Amen? One of the prayers that we have to keep praying is, God, may my life be a testimony for you. Help me see my life to be fit, that you showcase a template through me, that you can showcase the preservation of my generation through me. Amen? You don't need to be called as a blacksmith, but God is always looking for people. In this season, one thing that we must understand and not begin to fight against in our generation is that God will send people. There will be blacksmiths who are skilled at helping us to fine-tune the tools that we will use in this season as the church. There will be blacksmiths that will teach us how to help us, the arrows, the weapons, to stand strong against the enemy till the end. There are certain people he has called into the fivefold offices, but they are people. Amen? Can I ask you a question in the church today? If you don't mind just putting your hands up very tall so I can see. If you think you are called as a blacksmith, let me see your hand, please. Okay? If most of us put our hands up, that's a problem. It's not going to be most of us. That's what I'm trying to drive at here. God will send a few people as blacksmiths. How many people was Joseph? One. How many people did he save? Anybody know? Try and put a figure to it. How many people did he save? Sorry? Millions. As they left Egypt, it was millions. One person was sent ahead for the preservation of millions. Amen. Can someone repeat after me? God, use my life as a template to show the suffering of Job. You were quiet. <laughs> you don't want that one. <laughs> Someone said that's brazy. <laughs> okay, mate. Say, God, use my life as a template to show the faith of Abraham. I know you like that one. Use my life as a template to show the restitution. Of the prostitute Rahab. Oh. <laughs> Amen. Let's move on to another example. <laughs> Moses. If you read Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 to 10, you can read about him in your own time. Another scripture that refers to this is Acts chapter 7, verse 34. I want us to read that um, uh, uh, version of the story of Moses. Stephen, before he got stoned to death, you will see him in heaven. Amen glorious day can't wait to see some people bible said that david was ruddy basically david was ginger i want to see what it looks like i know it's weird isn't it How, like, what does he look like i want to see let me get to heaven amen let's keep going i know it's it, anyway let me not get distracted acts chapter 7 verse 34 nkjv sorry verse 30 let's start from verse 30 we'll, we'll go from 30 to 34 stephen was recounting the story of moses Moses basically says or has the same encounter in Exodus chapter 3, 7 to 10. He says, And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame, a fire, in a bush, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, verse 32, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come. Guess what it says next? I will send you. I've heard the groanings of my people. Why can't God send an angel to deliver them or strike from heaven and break them free into the promised land? Guess what God's solution is? He says, I will send you, Moses, into Egypt. Please, I want this to sink into us that there are certain men and women God is going to raise in our time with these callings as blacksmiths to arm us in the church ready for the end times. 
God is raising people. And the mistake the generations before us have made where they got jealous and they started to pull them down. You know the crab mentality. If a crab is trying to rise up the bucket, you're pulling them down. And you're saying, why this one? Why not me? Instead, we change our mindset and say, it's better to be armed. Whoever God uses, glory be to God. Amen? Another example, Deborah. Excuse me. I'm trying to show you. I'm going to go from Old to New Testament. I'm going to use male and female to show you God is not biased in the way he's going to move in this season. But he is raising blacksmiths, particularly apostles and prophets in this season. Because the church body has failed to recognize the fullness of the, the quiver we have available to us. All the different kinds of arrows to shoot and to use to attack. The kind of spear, the dagger. Does anybody play Call of Duty? Not me. So, <laughs> Judges chapter 5. <laughs> I can barely play FIFA. <laughs> Judges chapter 5 verse 7. Amen. Shut up, Toga. I beat you. I, st I still beat you even though I couldn't play. Yeah, I can't see you still. <laughs> Deborah, Judges chapter 5 verse 7. It says, village life ceased. Deborah was singing the song. She made a song. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel. Do you know that if you read scriptures and study the life of someone like David, every season he went through, there was always a song. It just dawned on me. We should always have a song for every season. Anyway, let's go back. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel. Until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. Everybody was, scattered. we didn't know what to do, but a woman said, I arose. I stood my ground. If you read the story of Deborah, the way she spoke to Barak, she said, if you don't go, I will go. And I will get the glory for this, the win. She said, I'm going to send you my younger. You go and you taste some victory because I'm already strong. Amen. Ah. <sighs> Anybody see what happened with the Conservative Party this weekend? I could not believe it. I want to see all the women after service because I need to encourage you. I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. It doesn't matter where you're from. The point is, usually we're so used to the system winning. I don't know how long you've been in the country or in the West. We're used to the system winning. I said there's no way this woman, if you're not into politics, Google it or check on TikTok or uh, ChatGPT and search for Cam, Cam? Kemi Badinok. I could not believe it. She's Nigerian. She's now the leader of the cons conservatives, not even Labour or Lib Dem. Conservatives, I couldn't believe it. I said, God, a woman has a rose. <laughs> Another example, Esther. Esther chapter 4, verse 13 to 14. Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet you who knows, sorry, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I can give you example after example after example of God raising individuals. Let's talk about Samuel. Let's talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus. If you read the book of Luke chapter 1, you see the way the angel of God visits her and says you have been favored amongst women. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about Paul the apostle. How about Priscilla and Aquila? God used them. We always quote that scripture. Paul plants, Apollos watered. What you don't know is Apollos only knew the um, gospel of John. He didn't know the gospel of the Holy Spirit. Priscilla and Aquila, first of all, I find it interesting that the Bible addresses them as woman and man, not man and woman. I found that interesting, just putting that out there, you know. Priscilla and Aquila, they listen to Apollo's preaching. He preaches powerfully in the Gospel of John, and they're sat back as blacksmiths. They say, we need to equip this boy to understand the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. If you read the, the uh, account of how they took him in and started to drill him, this is how, and he becomes a man full, equipped, like Ephesians chapter 4. The body of Christ is now equipped by the five head. The fivefold, I said five head. <laughs> equipped to live out as God expects. 
prophecies have been released from scripture, I'm talking about scripture, of how in the last days God is going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Men and women, young and old, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, Gen, Gen X, Bostas, Millennials, all of us. We're going to shine like, look, what God wants to do in our time now, the church has never seen it before. But for us to be able to deliver like that, imagine you go to the farm and you're using your hands to dig. We need to be equipped with tractors because there's, there's something deep God wants to unleash in this end times. If you're using your hand, how long is it going to take to get to some of the gold and some of the treasures that God wants to bring out through the church into the world in this time? Amen. Can I ask you a question? Does anybody know that Samuel, sorry, Samson made it to heaven? Don't worry, I'm not preaching heresy. I'm going to show you something. Does anybody, okay, put your hands up if you believe Samson made it to heaven. Put it high. Don't lie, man. Let's see your hands so we can check who is. Keep it up. Let's check on this side. Nobody on this side? No one's brave? Okay, middle. How many of you? It's about six. At the back? Okay, choir side. How many of you know Samson made it to heaven? Okay, let me show you scripture. Everybody open to Hebrews chapter 11. Let's start from verse 32. I'm going to shock you today. Watch. That means you are not reading your Bible. <laughs> Hebrews 32. Sorry, 11. Let's start from 32. NLT version. Everybody has to see this because your eye has to open to something today. For the first time, you will clock. And I'll tell you why I'm bringing up Samson today. How much more do I need to say? It will take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon. Barak. What does it say there? Oh, why is he being mentioned? But keep reading. Jephthah, David, is being mentioned with Samson? Keep reading. Samuel and all the prophets. Next verse. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shot the mouth of li mouths of lions. Keep going. Quenched the flames of fire and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness has turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Next verse. Women received their loved ones back again from death, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Keep going. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Keep going. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. Fam. Others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. Keep going. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes and in the ground, and holes in the ground. Keep going, please. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them received all that God had promised. You can go to the next verse as just a finisher because it's the last one. For God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. All those people that have been mentioned. Do you believe David is in heaven? Do you believe Samuel is in heaven? Do you believe Samson is in heaven? Is it weird that Samson is in heaven? Somebody talk to someone next to you and say, is that not weird? Is it, haven't we been taught that Samson was, he finished in a weird way? Talk to someone next to you. Is it weird that Samson is in heaven? Sam, is it weird? Anybody angry that Samson is in heaven? Amen? Why am I showing you this scripture? I'm not just trying to make you laugh or give you something new. It's that sometimes the blacksmiths that God is going to raise might have defects. So, oh, I know, I know. <laughs> sometimes the defects, the blacksmiths, the very people that God will call to say, this person is a prophet, is an apostle, is a teacher. You will notice, have you, has anybody noticed any defects with me? Ah, I have many defects. 
<laughs> sometimes, sometimes I'm praying and I say, God, are you sure? I say, I say, God, like, have you deeped me? Like, I say, I'm a bit weird. Like, I'm very quirky. Like, apart from being quirky, some, I, I can start to list some stuff. I say, God, are you sure you chose properly? Is this correct? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes God has anointed a man of God, woman of God, but they're slow. Let's, let's talk truthfully. Sometimes your, the person God has called to equip you in this season, ah, you say, I'm sure you could have made this decision much faster than this. <laughs> ah, I can go through some defects. We can go through those different people on the list and, and check what are some of the things that they did wrong. Samuel, the great prophet, didn't train his kids. He saw what happened to Eli and yet his kids, they did the same thing. <laughs> I'm not talking about a lack of integrity. That's not good. But you'll notice that the people, the very people that God is calling, they will have defects. But as a generation, we must wake up and stop allowing the devil rob us of what is good because of some bad things no no longer if you see gold in its pure form or rather before it's mined or rather when it's mined before it's refined before it's refined that's better you won't like it it's not nice many of you think gold exists as the bullion bars under the ground and you just go and just pick it up and put it in their safe it doesn't work like that <laughs> it doesn't look nice it does not look nice you have to refine it, get rid of it. You have to put it through, put some metals, put heat, do it, and shape it. And then you put the brand in. And then when they show you, oh, the bullion bars that exist. Does anybody know how much a bullion bar is? In Anybody? You need to go and do some research, man. It's, it's close to 60K now for a bullion bar. It's, it's a good form of investment, just saying, you know, in case you are looking for somewhere to invest. <laughs> Amen. Quick question. Why does God knowing our defects, still use human beings? Why doesn't God send angels to deliver this and to train the people? Does anybody know? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In our weakness, it shows the strength of God that despite our weakness, God is still able to pass through his will, his purposes, his plans. It brings more glory to God. It brings more glory to God. God's power is perfected in our weakness. Why am I saying this? Because not all of you, I mean, I, I might not even be here in the next three to five, ten years. I don't know what God's plan for me is. Some of you over the years, you come for two years, one year, three years, you go to the next place, you don't mind if you're breaking my heart, it's fine, it's okay. <laughs> Wherever you find yourself, don't forget this. The people that God will send you to, they're not going to be perfect. But you must learn to see. You must learn to see. Eli Elijah was a man that had anger problems. He was a bit angry and impatient. But Elisha looked past it and said, I'm going to follow you to the end. There's something that you're carrying that I need for my destiny. Amen? My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. When, whenever God uses flawed people, his power becomes more visible, showing that his work is not dependent on human perfection, but on divine power. That way, the focus remains on God and not the individual's abilities. So now that I've told you, I can't wait to see Samson in heaven. Do you know that theologians say Samson did not have big muscles? That he looks like a normal man. That's what frightened the Philistines. That they were trying to clock. Because if he had big muscles, then you can say, oh, he's bang Jim. He can bench 200. That's why he's carrying us and killing us with the ghost jawline. Fair enough. But he looks like a normal man. And he was still carrying the pillars. So they're trying to figure out this. This one is not normal. <laughs> What's going on here, mate? <laughs> I look at him. Imagine if I'm taller than Samson. I don't think so, but hey. 
<laughs> Amen. Uh, back in the day, I'll finish with this because of time. Back in the day, I, um, I used to have a friend. Well, he wasn't really my friend, but my mom and his mom were friends. So, And I used to get dropped off at his house a lot. He used to play for United. He's called Tico. And um, he played center mid. He played center mid with a guy called Ravel Morrison. Don't worry, just follow the story. And I used to go to Tico's house all the time. Uh, sometimes we're playing football. And I take trainers. I'm not that good at football, but, you know, take the trainers from his shed or something. There was one old black trainer, some night trainers. I never picked those ones because I don't, they didn't look nice. So one day we were playing football. Ravel came to the house. He took those trainers because he needed trainers. They were his size. We went to play football. Guys, I've never seen a footballer like that boy before in my life. All of us were just stood. We tried our best to get the ball off him. It didn't work. I, 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 was, I was much fitter then. My stomach had not come at that time. <laughs> we, we were chasing him. Look, he was playing games with us. Follow me, I'm going somewhere. It got to a point, he was, the skills, he's so skillful. He got bored, he chips the goalkeeper from the halfway line. I said, what kind of, what is all this? <sighs> Follow me. We finished the session. He smoked all of us and he's like, yeah, this was pre-training before his normal training. We got home to Tico's house and he dropped the trainers. Ever since that day, I took that trainers. <laughs> I said, I must wear these trainers. There's something in the trainers. I wear the trainers. Guys, next time we play, I flopped. Guess what? It wasn't about the trainers. Who was it about? Him. It's not about us. When we show the defects, that's where I'm going. As God is manifesting his glory, it's not about us. So when you see that God is raising blacksmiths and you spot one or two challenges, you're like, ah, God, are you, this can't be the person. You understand that, look, God's glory is actually being made manifest. It's being made manifest. The trainers were dusty. They, they don't even look that nice. But when he put them on, he was chipping the goalkeeper. I said, boy. <laughs> <sighs> it is well. Amen. May God help us. Don't worry, it's fine. I'm, I'm not called to be a footballer, so I'm not worried. Amen? <laughs> May God help us to understand and to accept the people that he will bring salvation, bring training and correction through. The very people he will use to build his church. May we accept and stop as a generation that's so big on cancel culture, any small thing, canceled, blocked, no new friends. I knew I never should have followed them anyway. Caught, count. Ah. Oh, God. <laughs> Amen. I'm, I'm quite memeable. I think I should probably like sign myself up for NFTs or something. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. To give you a cliffhanger for next week, I wanted to start to look into, there are three aspects or three levels of the apostolic. Because this series, we want to both bring your eyes to some stuff, but teach as well. Three levels on the apostolic. The first one, which is the same for every believer, is what we call the mandate. The apostolic mandate of the believer. Uh, you know, for each of the fivefold, this will be the case. There are three major levels. You can call them different titles, but you'll find that they fit in this way. Every believer has or fits under the apostolic mandate. Apostolic mandate, excuse me. The second level is what we call the gift or the capacity of the apostolic office. Please understand what I'm saying. You're not an apostle but you operate at a higher level apostolically. I'm using the words very intentionally of that gifting that exists. So you're not just doing the mandate like every believer. And when we look at the prophetic, I will give definitions as well. Don't worry, I'm going to break it down because I know some of you, you are just confused. You're like, what does this mean, man? I'm going to show you, man. Okay? Second level, gift or capacity. And then the third level is what we call the governance or the office of the apostle. 
not everybody is called to the governance or the office of the apostle, but coming down to the first level, every Christian, the moment you come into Christ, we are apostolic. Every single one of us is apostolic. Then the second level is the gift or the capacity, and then the third level, and I'm going to take my time and break it down very quickly. Let me give you seven things that are attached to the apostolic mandate for every Christian, and we will finish the sermon today. Every Christian should operate in these seven areas or seven levels. Some of you will say, yeah, I heard that before, but we've not actually deep that this makes us an apostolic people as we fulfill these things. Number one, the apostolic mandate that applies to every Christian. Number one, we must proclaim the good news. Proclaiming the good news. If you read Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20 from the NLT version, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always to the end of the age, proclaiming the good news. Number two, the second thing that everyone as a Christian, the apostolic mandate that re relates to every single Christian is number two, living as ambassadors for Christ. Living as ambassadors for Christ. What does that mean? The values of Christ, not just in the church, but at work. Not just in the church, at work, in your relationships. When someone slaps you on one side, what do we do? You are a mug for Christ. You don't fight back. We had a session with the men and someone said, yeah, what, what, what if you're walking with your, your, your girl and someone slaps her bum? So you're not going to swing for them. I said, are you a Christian? Do you, look, it, I was surprised how surprised the guys were when I said, you take your girl and you run away. They said, so I, I, won't, I won't defend. I said, that's your flesh. They slap you on one side. What do you do? You let them slap you again. <laughs> they cheat you on one side. Do you let them cheat you again? That's on you, boy. <laughs> Values of Christ, not just in the church. So many Christians are Christians in the church. You're fake. Turn to someone else and say, You're fake. Turn to the person and say, I'm not fake, man. He's not talking about me. Stop saying it so aggressively. You live in church. You're fake. You're coming to church on Sunday. Saturday night, you're asking for repentance. God, I'm sorry. I did it again. Is your name Britney Spears? <laughs> uh, that wasn't supposed to be that funny. Thanks. <laughs> We're not condemning anybody. We don't condemn. Anyone that comes to God, God will not forsake you. The righteous man can fall seven times and get back up again. But intentionally in your heart... That is your way of living. You say, I'm, I, I like the worship. I like the banter. I like the food they give after service. And I, I like that I get to see one or two girls that I wouldn't normally see. I'm looking for a wife. Do you know, I find that weird. People are looking for spouses. They go to church to look for someone good. Oh, God. Let's go back. Let me not get distracted. Time is gone. Time is gone. Amen. <laughs> Values of Christ. Not just in the church. Outside, in the place of work. You go to the gym. What you will never wear to church. In the gym. Do you know, we were talking at locker room. We spoke, we spoke. Oh, I said, sometimes it's hard to go to the gym. Because you're trying to do rowing machine, podcast. You are focusing. And in front of you, one dingling, 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 dingling. With the tightest dingling, dingling, and sometimes they're in front of you doing stairs, dingling, dingling, like, ah, uh, and, and they put their phone, oh my God, this is so hard, man, uh, guys, I'm, I'm losing my weight, and you're trying to be innocent, listening, you're even listening to sermon, what sermon? Gatu, gata. <laughs> Let's, look, let me speak to the women today, you're going to the gym, wear a top that covers your bum, We must be different. We 
must be different. You're going to the gym because I know the women are saying, well, how about the lads? The tightest top in your cupboard. Some of you even take your tops off. Yo, oh, yeah, yeah. Can I, can I have that weight, please? Spread your back with your... T- it's not just in church. You're laughing, but you do it. You do it. You're coming to church. You cover up outside. You go for dinner. I'm, I'm not condemning anybody. And if you want to block me on, on social media, that's on you, innit? But I'm telling you the truth. I see some of you. I say, oh, this is not the best way. <laughs> oh, look, that, you know that style of top where the middle is gone and you're seeing the side of the cleavage and, and you're going for dinner just out with my girls. What girls? These girls? Oh. In case you're new, we don't condemn. We don't condemn. <laughs> <laughs> Second Corinthians 5 verse 20 scripture for this 2 Corinthians 5 20 it says so we are Christ's ambassadors what did we use as one of the words that described apostolos the Greek word a delegate, an ambassador, a navy uh, envoy or seal we are Christ's ambassadors God is making his appeal through us We speak for Christ when we plead. Come back to God. Stop wearing dress with cut out in the middle. Stop it. Wearing the tightest jeans you can find. So we see the shape. Why? I'm talking to the guys. Because we have to always balance it. (laughs) Verse 21. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin. So that we could be made right with God through Christ. Do you know, Casey was the first time I saw that there are some people who are doing certain things and it's not because they're bad people, but where they came from at home, the mom has said, this is how you get guys. So I'm appealing to you if you've grown up in a home or it's not been an issue before now, that there's a different way for us as Christians in the kingdom of God to do things. There's a different way. There's a different way. You're not going to get 50 million so you can show off and show to your school teacher that said you were going to be a failure, that you made it. That's not, the, that's not the kingdom way to do things. It's not. It's not. Some of you are working hard. What's your biggest motivating factor? To prove to those that hate it on you that you're going to make it in life. You will find out you get there. They don't even care. And then your life feels empty. Amen. Let's move on. Third thing with the apostolic mandate is engaging in reconciliation. Engaging in reconciliation. Every Christian should be part of this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 19, it says, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Verse 19, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. I was, I was sharing when we did the top session on friendship. And I said, you see someone fighting, you say, it's none of my business. It's not on me. It is on you as an apostolic mandate person in the Christian kingdom of God. Amen? It is on you. You must be involved. Someone around you is fighting. It should concern you. You shouldn't be comfortable. Is there wisdom to be applied? Where you're getting involved in every detail? Of course there is. But I'm saying this callous nature, which means, you know, the way your skin goes hard on your palm. We've become hard. We don't care. It it doesn't even, we're we're numb to it now. Clear your minds. (laughs) We've, We've become numb to it. Reconciliation, engaging in reconciliation. It might look like offering forgiveness, breaking down barriers between people, facilitating peace where there's division. Reconciliation not only applies to spiritual restoration, it can also extend to social and relational healing, 
aligning with God's heart to bring wholeness in every area of life. Amen? One of your boys is fighting. I'm speaking to you now. Listen to me. One of your boys is fighting. And you know, if only this person understood that, yeah, what they said was a bit mad, but like, they just need help because sometimes they can't express themselves. So it, it, what they said, it sounds deep, but for that person, it's not even that deep. And all you have to do is go to that boy and say, like, fam, sit down. Let me talk to you, fam. Like, I hear what he did. Trust me. But if you understand how this person is, let me even show you some texts. See, this is how he talks. He didn't even mean it like that. I promise you. This is how it looks. He said, oh, I'm not getting involved in that. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> Next one. Time is gone. But I will finish today. Don't worry. Because I know some of you are not happy with me. <laughs> Amen. Um, number four. Is that correct? Making disciples. Making disciples. Making, what did I say? Making disciples. Does it say it's for the apostles alone? No, it does not say that. Let me show you where it does not say that. Matthew 28 verse 19. Matthew 28 verse 19. What does it say? Therefore, apostles only go and make, what does it say? It says go. Who was it speaking to? Everybody. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Guess what? The next verse says, teach these new disciples. The teaching is not just for the person on the pulpit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Making new disciples. It's not just for a select few do you know what we've done in the church? We're very good at evangelism. The few that are even good at evangelism. And that's where we've stopped. But guess what God's order or desire for us as people who are apostolic is that we make disciples. We make new disciples. There's a constant flow of disciple making consistently. Not just for one or two or the person on the stage. Everybody. Number five. Serving as salt and light. Serving as salt and light. What does that scripture say? You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, verse 16, let your light so shine. I'm changing the version now. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Having this mandate as Christians, this apostolic mandate, let your light so shine. Some of you, in the name of I'm introverted, your light is hidden. I'm speaking to you today. I don't care if you're an ambivert, introvert, sidevert, lightvert, any vert that you are. Wake up. Turn to your neighbor and say, wake up. Let your light so shine that men, women, children, even dogs, they should see your good works and say, rah, woof, woof. <laughs> Let, fam, oh, man. They, they say, whoa, tweet, 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 tweet. <laughs> Fam, good, good, good. That was good. That was good. Let people around you, your environment. If you think I'm joking, the scripture says all of creation eagerly awaits the manifestation of the sons of God. Let the birds in the air be like, man, God, you made someone called Josh today. A man called Josh is waking up. Let your light so shine. Turn to someone next to you. Say, let your light so shine. Someone said, yes, 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 yes. Say it properly. Let your light so shine. <sighs> it's a call to preserve goodness, bring healing, shine a guiding light in dark places. Living a salt and light can be as simple as showing kindness, standing up for justice, living out biblical principles, thereby influencing culture in a way that reflects God's kingdom. I want to challenge us today 
on this point. Look deeply at your immediate surroundings and say, how can I be light? It doesn't have to be huge, but how can I be light in my surroundings? What can I do practically? Not just in the church. It's good to start from home, yes, start in the church. But how can I be light? How can I be light? I can hear you at the back, guys. How can I be light? How can I be light in my community, in my surroundings? How can I be light? What projects can I take on? But guess what? Not just doing good deeds, but doing it in such a way that you glorify God in heaven. Sometimes you watch some of the awards. I mean, we don't know how true it is, but at least some of them are trying. <laughs> They come to do the speech. I just want to thank God. You say, ah, thank God. God is being mentioned. Amen? In such a way, people are dazzled. They say, how do you achieve this? Like, you need to break it down. Like, what did you do? And you see it as an opportunity. You say, God be praised. I just want you to know, everybody sit down, sit down, sit down. You, you called me. You called me. You want to know the secret? Yes, we want to know the secret. Are you sure you want to know? We want to know the secret. Are you sure? I'm very sure. Tell us. It's God. Open your scriptures to John chapter 1. <laughs> Final point today. Sorry, sorry, my bad. Penultimate point today. <laughs> Apostolic mandates. Demonstrating God's power. Demonstrating God's power. This is not just for one or two people. It's not just for one or two people. I, sh I share this many times, and I want this to sink for you for the rest of your lives. If the devil is given an option to shoot a monstrous bear that has venom coming from its teeth, it has big claws and it's coming with a machine gun and a swarm of bees, which one do you choose? The bear. It's a bigger target to hit. But God is raising so many. He doesn't even know. He said, where do we start from? Do, should we start from the choir? Let's take clarity. Well, if we take clarity, John. <laughs> if we take John, who can I see here? I don't know your face, sorry. Alessia, we stand up. He said, you know what? We don't even know what to do. May God help us. Demonstrating God's power. Mark chapter 16, verse 16 to 18. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. This is the key verse. These miraculous signs will accompany all those who believe. It doesn't say those on the stage, everyone that believes, they will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. We've dealt with this before. Verse 18, they will be able to handle snakes with safety. It's not speaking of snakes and scorpions, literally. If you carry a snake and it, you get bitten, we will pray for you and say sorry. But fam, the scripture is not talking about literal snakes and scorpions. It's talking about principalities, powers, that you will enter positions where you're dealing with some entities, but it will not hurt you. You will get to work. The way we're sat here in church, some of you don't think that it's possible, but the way you're sat here in church, do you know there are some people that visit some particular places before the week to also prepare themselves? Do you know? You don't know. Do you know that some of your colleagues are witches? I'm not trying to scare you. You come to church and you're very bold about being a Christian. Some people also, they go somewhere. Because everybody wants to do well. <laughs> and we all know in life, you can't do it by yourself. You, you get to a point where you clock, I'm not big enough. If you're serious about life, you clock that, ah, it's not possible. Every smart person that's achieved, even the ones that try to run away from God, they always say, yeah, we know there's a driving force. We've seen one or two things in our lives. Everybody knows there's somewhere you have to visit. There's an altar you must service. Everyone knows. You get to work, something has been done, some words have been chanted, some things have been said. This is how you will make a mistake on this deal. And you get involved, this is how you'll make a mistake on this project for uni, for course, for your coursework, and so on and so forth. This is what this scripture refers to. They will handle snakes with safety. If they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. It's not just for one or two people at the front. You can pray. Put your hand on the person next to you and say, I pray for you. Say, receive. Don't put it on their heads, please. Just put it on their shoulders and say, receive the power of the Lord. Push the person. Say, receive the power. <laughs> Amen. For all believers, this means praying boldly, trusting in God's power for healing, provision and transformation, and believing that God works through them to impact others. And finally, the last point today. Uh, for 
everybody under the apostolic mandate is building up the church building up the church if you check ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 to 16 uh, and scriptures that talk about spiritual gifts they talk about how we are actually supposed to edify one another building up the church so as someone who operates under the apostolic mandate as a christian any christian should be able to operate on all these seven levels that i've listed is it seven or eight seven levels that i've listed this is your portion this is our portion every single one of us and this week i want you to go back and review the list and say are there any points of this these seven or this seven that's missing in my life any parts of this seven that i've thought oh this can never be me this is not for me this is for other people excuse me Go back this week and say, God, I repent, first of all. Help me to step into the fullness of this. May God help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you. Next week we proceed. Uh, and I'll talk about the second level. And then I'll begin to explain the office of the apostle. Why do we need to know this? It's very important that we can discern falsehood. When you know what's correct, if someone's doing something that doesn't align, you can tell this is wrong. But also, it's something that you seek so that you can gain the reward. As I showed you in that scripture, anyone that approaches a prophet in the name of a prophet will get a prophet's reward. If you approach someone in the name of that person, the way God, and I showed you, God puts things inside people. Inside, I don't know why, it's God's sovereign wisdom but inside people, someone can be an institution. Someone walking can literally be the preservation for your destiny. Not because that person is special. I told you, the trainer is not special. It's the person wearing the trainer that makes the trainer special. When I say trainer, I mean the trainers, like shoes. God is the one using those people. To the extent that even someone like Samson can mess up, but God can still be the one using him to get his glory. Wherever you find yourself in the world, you must always look. Who is that person? And even if you're a blacksmith yourself, there are different levels of blacksmiths. So if you're a blacksmith, God has called you to someone to also look to. Amen? <laughs> there must always be someone to equip and build you up. Everywhere you get to in your life, say, God, who is the blacksmith? Who are the blacksmiths in my life that you have called me to? And, and God, help me to see them the way Elisha saw Elijah. Help me to see them in the way I'm supposed to see. Help me to interact so that the equipping I need in this season of my life or the seasons of my life, I never miss them. Thank you, Father. We give you praise, oh God. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen.